so good evening and i am very happy to be here to share my knowledge on ayurveda and i thanks region foundation for giving me this wonderful opportunity some people don't need introduction and i always feel whenever i give talk on ayurveda i feel i need to introduce myself this is more to uh, help the audience uh, understand my uh, talk on ayurveda in context so i did my phd uh, in physics with specialization in nmr which stands for nuclear magnetic resonance i did uh, this from cambridge university uk many many years ago and uh, much later almost uh, 13 14 years after my uh, uh, phd uh, i decided to do medicine and uh, although i had uh, admission for mbbs i opted for ayurveda so you will see this my physics background getting reflected in the way i uh, uh, explain ayurveda so when we think of uh, state of the art medicine the kind of visual that would flash through your mind is something like this a pur purposeful looking doctor a professional looking doctor supported by intense research and development and the medicine he or she practices support, supported by uh, technical advances right now when we think of ayurveda let us not pretend something like this comes to our mind yes so why am i asking this question then ayurveda is it antiquated or state of the art the differences seem to be obvious these two systems seem to be diametrically opposite does this question even make any sense before i go into the discussion before we explore this further uh, let's uh, let me re uh, refresh your memories on a few basic information all medical systems or applied sciences they are all shaped and contributed by the basic or fundamental sciences so the basic sciences provide concepts theories and methodologies to understand the biological system to understand the physiology to explain and interpret the pathophysiology to be able to do the diagnosis and provide technique techniques for diagnosis and treatment so if you look at the state of the art medicine which is the modern medicine the three fundamental sciences which have contributed to modern medicine and, and has shaped it they are physics chemistry and mathematics now i'm not going to go into the nitty gritty details of this but this is just to give you all an idea about the kind of inputs these fundamental sciences have provided let's look at some of the inputs from physics you will see that almost all the disciplines in physics have contributed have shaped modern medicine now let's remember that the objective of physics is not to develop medicine the objective of physics is something else the objective is to understand reality understand nature right and biology and medicine has they have taken whatever they require from physics to develop their own system right so for example if you take mechanics the concepts and theories on energy and power have been used to understand how muscles act and the applied aspect is the development of prosthetics you can see this in all these disciplines be it fluid dynamics thermodynamics electricity and magnetism sound and light even quantum phenomena mr magnetic resonance it was discovered by physicists to understand the atoms the magnetic properties associated with atoms and chemists used it to understand atomic structure or molecular structure right but then modern medicine has you is using it in a very different way for imaging and which is used extensively by radiologists for diagnosis now this said the fundamental contribution by physics 
to modern medicine is how it has understood the nature of reality. How has it understood reality is what has given the shape modern medicine has today. Now why is this very important? Because when you take clinical medicine, what is of fundamental importance or diagnosis and treatment? In fact, clinical medicine, be it Ayurveda, be it uh, allopathy, be it homeopathy, it begins with diagnosis and ends with treatment. So diagnosis defines how treatment is going to be given and something is going to define how diagnosis is done. So if the diagnosis is done based on cells and proteins and genes, it means that something else is influencing the way diagnosis is done. And so how the human system is understood will define how the diagnosis is done. So far so good, nothing, uh, the information is nothing new. But what probably people have not realized is something else defines how the human system is understood. How the nature is understood, how the reality is understood, what the world view is of the fundamental science which has contributed to medicine will define how the human system is going to be understood. This will define diagnosis, this will define treatment. Which is why the single most fundamental uh, contribution of physics to modern medicine is this. Now, Let's look at what is what world view has been adopted by modern medicine from physics. Physics has two branches, quantum physics and uh, Newton physics, Newtonian physics or classical physics. The world view of both these are very different. But the world view of the, the Newton physics, Newtonian physics is what has been adopted by most of the western science. So it says that reality is made of material objects. It says objects behave deterministically and governed by physical laws. Larger objects can be reduced to smaller ones. There is exclusion of mind and matter. There is a de-link of mind and matter. Universe is a huge impersonal machine governed by strictly mechanical principles. These are some of the world view points of classical physics. And although all of these have played a role in the way health is understood, health and disease process is understood in modern medicine, I would like to focus on this particular point. Larger objects can be reduced to smaller ones. So the larger object which is the human system is reduced to the smaller ones. So this is a model we are all very familiar with. We study in school. Atom is a fundamental building block of everything physical in the universe. right? So atoms make molecules, molecules make organelles, organelles make cells, you have tissue, organ, organ system and the entire organism is understood in terms of the various systems. You have reproductive system, you have cardiovascular system, you have endocrine system and so on. These are organs put together which contribute to a particular function. Now modern medicine is called also known to have a reductionistic approach because the entire human organism his system is reduced to its fundamental entities and the focus is basically on structures. So modern medicine has a structural viewpoint. It also has a biochemical viewpoint but it uses the same structural hierarchical model wherein it talks about biochemistry at each level. So you have a molecular biochemistry, you have a cellular biochemistry and so on. But this is a model that has been adopted by a modern medicine. This structural point is reflected in everything that, that is done, be it analogies used for explaining, be it diagnosis, treatment or even diet and nutrition. Example, heart is considered as a pump. The function of the heart is to pump blood, right? If you look at diagnosis, you all may wonder why I am talking about modern medicine before I know and not on Ayurveda. I am using modern medicine as the GPS. It is a mainstream medicine and it is a system of medicine we all uh, we are all very familiar with. So let us, so it is easy to compare and contrast Ayurveda with modern medicine, it becomes easier. So if you look at diagnosis, all the imaging modalities be it x-ray, ultrasound, MRI, CT, all are structure based. They look for structural abnormalities. 
even the biochemical um, diagnosis based on biochemistry, they are still structure based. For example, if you take a di uh, diabetes, you are either looking for a reduction in insulin, which is a molecule, which is a structural entity, or an increased glucose, which is again a structural entity. The microbiology based diagnosis also looks for structures. So, for example, like bacteria or virus or parasite, all these are structural entities. And the treatment strategies, again, is in sync with, it has to be in sync with the diagnosis. So, rectifying the structures or replacing the structures or supplementing the deficiencies or the structural manipulation done when drugs are given. So, you will see that the reductionism runs as an undercurrent to everything that's done in modern medicine. Now, with this brief introduction to modern medicine and how it is uh, how it's it's viewing the human system. Let me change gear and go on to Ayurveda. Ayurveda is the science of life. The starting point of Ayurveda and modern medicine are very, very different. Modern medicine is a science of disease. The entry of focus has been on understanding the pathophysiology and improving the diagnosis and the treatment. Okay. Now, the starting platform for Ayurveda is very different. It is a science of life and it is a, it's an indigenous medical system of not only India but the entire Indian subcontinent. It has uninterrupted medical practices, a very conservative estimate uh, would put it to about 5000 years old. Now you can use this information either to credit Ayurveda or to discredit it. You can say something as old as 5000 cannot have any contemporary relevance. Or you can say 5000 years is a long time for a system to have observed how this, the biological system works. The amount of observations they would have accrued over 5000 years and the amount of wisdom they would have got, how much they would have learnt. So then you begin to think that Ayurveda must be much, much more wiser than the system which is about 200 years old. The choice is yours how you want to use this number. It's one of the most systematically documented systems and it's not an empirical medicine, it's a theory based system. So since Ayurveda is a science of life, it deals with both health and disease. When it talks of health, it talks about preventive and promotive health. When it talks of disease, it talks about how to cure. People generally presume that Ayurveda's strength is in preventive and promotive health, but the curative aspect is equally strong. Let's see how health is understood in Ayurveda. Ayurveda says <coughs> health is a complete balance of functioning of tissues, their metabolic end products, senses, mind, consciousness and social and ecological well-being. Absence of disease alone is not health. WHO, maybe a couple of decades ago, it said it defined health as absence of disease. But now it has, it, the definition given by WHO is uh, not a simple absence of disease. It says health is a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. You can not only see the similarity between the two, you can also see that the understanding of health in Ayurveda is much more comprehensive. They are talking about ecological health as well, social and ecological health and how it affects, impacts health of an individual. In a way, it's not surprising because, you know, I said the starting platform for Ayurveda is different. It started off as understanding health and then it talks about what, how things can go wrong and a person can become a patient. So I told you all that all medical systems or applied sciences and they are founded on basic sciences and I also uh, told you the kind of inputs that uh, physics had given to medicine. Ayurveda is also an applied science and there are fundamental sciences which has shaped Ayurveda. The inputs, the fundamental sciences are from Darshana. Darshana means to see, to view, to have an insight. And interestingly, 
the word theory from the Greek word theoria also means to see, to view, to have an insight. So darshanas traditionally they are called uh, the Indian philosophies and the objective of these Indian philosophies are different. Just like the objective of physics is different, the objective of darshanas are also different and Ayurveda just like modern medicine and biology had done, Ayurveda has taken whatever it requires for developing itself. So the darshanas offers uh, theories and concepts on physical and non-physical realities, creation, how universe, life and matter has been created, what constitutes a physical matter, what is the relationship between mind, body and consciousness, the tridoshas, vata, pitta and kapha which are used in Ayurveda to understand health and disease process and the Panchamahabhutas which are the fundamental elements which again uh, it is used in Ayurveda. Transformation of substances to form new products, concepts of measurements, time, weight and length and methodologies for scientific study and analysis. These are some of the inputs uh, taken from uh, the Dashanas by Ayurveda. And this gives you more detailed information. So the six darshanas which have contributed, which form the fundamental sciences for Ayurveda or Sankhya, Nyaya, Vaiseshika, Mimamsa, Yoga and Vedanta. So this gives you uh, some idea about the theories which were specific theories of uh, these um, uh, darshanas had put forth and how it has been used in Ayurveda. For example, Sankhya, it talks about origin of universe and life, evolution of matter, it talks about mind, body, consciousness, relationship, causality, the law of cause and effect is from Sankhya, the Tridosha and Saptadatus, the seven tissue elements. Vaiseshika is again a very interesting <coughs> um, darshana. It talks about the concept of atom. Let me hasten to add that the atom that the Vaiseshika Darshana talks about is not exactly the atom that modern physics talks about. There is a difference. Classification and property of matter, formation of new substances, heat and transformation, understanding of the physical body, understanding of herbs, drugs, drug combinations, processing of food and herbs. So you can see how Ayurveda has used information from Vaiseshika. Yoga, of course, it's very obvious. Yoga talks about union with ultimate reality. And Ayurveda uses this in the context of the human system, union of body, mind and consciousness in health and disease. Because all these three factors play a role in health and disease. There are many things that Vedanta talks about, but what is of interest to Ayurveda is interconnectedness and consciousness. And this has given uh, uh, rise to this, the way the human system is has been viewed, perceived by Ayurveda, humans as an indivisible whole. And Mimamsa is a very interesting darshana. It gives a logical decision support system for validating and interpreting texts. Let's say that there are three, two texts, and both of them, one says that there are three doshas, other other says that there are five doshas, right? So. They are talking about the same human system, but then you have contradictory views. So, Mimamsa gives you a logical interpretation. It gives you a very, very scientifically rigorous methodology to resolve conflicts. And uh, it helps you, gives you method for derivation of research hypothesis. It again talks of law of cause and effect. Nyaya gives you methods for deductive reasoning, logical inference. It offers 16 methods of scientific inquiry. And the 16 methods offered by Nyaya Darshana will ring a bell in any scientist because it, it follows, it talks about the methodologies that are even adopted, that are adopted even today by scientists. So these have been used for diagnosis, for nomenclature of known and unknown diseases and herbs and so on. So this is just a sample of the concepts and theories from these darshanas and what Ayurveda has, how Ayurveda has used them. 
So let's go back to this slide and we now know that this is the defining factor for how a system is going to diagnose and give the treatment. So I told you all how the nature is understood by classical physics and how that has defined the way human system is understood and that how that has defined diagnosis and treatment. So if Ayurveda, the treatment given by Ayurveda is different, it's because the, its diagnosis is different. If this is different, it's because the difference starts from here. So how did the ancient Indians understand the reality? The Indic worldview or the Vedic worldview is that of interconnectedness. So they say that nature exists as a continuum. The universe is a dynamic web of interconnected and inseparable entities in a dynamic relationship. This is the world view of the ancient Indians. This is in contrast to this world view of classical physics which is looking at the universe as being made up of building blocks, separate building blocks. Because of this concept of interconnectedness, all objects are considered a seamless whole connected within and without. And this applies to the human system as well. So the entire human system is understood in terms of four domains. There is a structural domain, there is a domain of physiology, there is a psychological domain, there is a domain of consciousness. Each domain is networked within. Let me hasten to tell you all that all these, this is not my own interpretation, this is how it is explained in Ayurveda. The entire structural domain is networked through channels. These channels would be blood vessels, lymphatic vessels, nerves. The entire physiological domain is networked through parameters defined by the tridoshas that is vata, pitta and kapha. I will be talking a bit more about this. The psychological domain is again uh, networked through psychological parameters. I will give you all an idea about this. And the domain of consciousness, which is the subtlest one, is networked through what's called levels of awareness. So each one is like a in interconnected module. And what is interesting is that there are areas of overlap. So structural and physiological domain is connected through BPK, that is Vata, Pitta and Kapha. Physiological and the psychological domain is again connected through VPK. The psychological and the domain of consciousness is connected through psychological parameters that I have mentioned here. What is very interesting is how the subtlest domain of consciousness is connected to the gross structural domain. It is connected through the first level of awareness. Now this perception of human as a seamless whole is very different to the structural hierarchical model used in modern medicine where atoms is the fundamental entity and you know there is a evolution and organization that takes place. Right? So we are effortlessly and seamlessly mind, body and soul according to Ayurveda. In fact Ayurveda not only talks about connectivity within, it says that from the core of our being to the vast expanse of the universe, we exist as one. The whole universe is the expansion of one's consciousness. So this is the perception of Ayurveda and this is how the human systems are understood. This is how the health and disease is understood in Ayurveda. So Ayurveda talks of connectedness not only within oneself but also with others, the nature and the cosmic reality. It offers methods, so these are not concepts, these do not remain as concepts. Ayurveda offers methods, practical methods to help live in harmony with oneself, with the society, with the world and the cosmos. Now ecological health and the health of the society is being beginning to be recognized as a major factor, as a very important factor in the health of an individual, right. So these are concepts, some of these are concepts beginning to be um, given importance in modern medicine. 
So, I think we can safely ask a question whether Ayurveda is antiquated because it not only is talking about this but it is also offering practical methods to, to be able to live in harmony with oneself, society, world and cosmos. Now let us get into the nitty gritty details of how Ayurveda classifies and understands the system because after all it is also it is a pragmatic clinical medicine where a person comes as a patient, the doctor looks at the symptoms, diagnoses and then gives treatment. So for this they need to have a good understanding of the human system. So there are two classifications in Ayurveda, one is a gross, it is called Stula Sharira, then you have a Sukshma Sharira which is the subtle body. The base, so what you see in a bracket here are the terms in Sanskrit, so structures are Dhatus and system wise classification is based on Srotas. This system wise classification is not the system wise classification that we know of in modern medicine, there is a difference. Both these cover the physical aspect. The functional classification covers physiological and psychological, of course when you say physiological implied is the physical aspect as well and the subtle aspect classification covers the psychological and the domain of consciousness. So some information about this subtle aspect of the body where it talks about levels of awareness, this is a contribution from yoga. So, this concept called Panchakoshas in yoga. So, the first level of awareness is the physical body. It is called Annamaya Kosha, which means that we are what we are by what we eat. The food we eat defines us. A dead person is not aware, does not have this level of awareness. The person must be live and ticking only then they will be able to aware, be aware of this physical body. So that is the first level of awareness. The second level of awareness is prana which is the energy. If I take a deep breath, so energy I am flows in and I should be aware of this. A patient in coma is not aware of this. This is a second level of awareness. The third level of awareness is Manas where we have information. I am aware that I know something about Ayurveda. So this awareness is the third level of awareness. The fourth level of awareness is the discriminative intelligence which is Vigyana Maya Kosha where we are able to discriminate between the right and the wrong. There is no point having information alone. You should be intelligent enough to use it in the right way. There is no point knowing that alcohol is does not do good for the liver. But do we keep ourselves out of away from uh, alcohol? That is discriminative intelligence. The next, the subtlest level or the fifth level of awareness is called Anandamaya Kosha. It's a level where one experiences harmony because we see we see the interconnectedness between between us between us and the environment between us and the uh, cosmos. So there's no difference of me and you. So this is these are the five levels of awareness, and here you go from the gross to subtle. And Ayurveda and yoga helps in ascent of matter back to consciousness from gross to subtle. So there is lot of importance given to the levels of awareness in Ayurveda because there is a close association between the levels of awareness and health. A change in perception in mind is reflected in the physiology, Ayurveda says and we know it. So mental regimens bring mind under control and prevent errors in judgment and action, again something we know. So regimens influencing mind is as important, considered as important as diet is and training the intellect is very important in maintaining the health, so says Ayurveda. And Ayurveda offers techniques for training the intellect. 
So all the concepts and theories in Ayurveda do not remain as concepts and theories. It is translated. Now we talk of translation, medicine. All these concepts and theories are translated into clinical practice and it empowers the individual to take health into his or her own hand. So that's uh, some information about this uh, subtle aspect of the human system. Let me go on to this functional uh, classification uh, that Ayurveda has adopted because this runs as an undercurrent to the entire understanding of health and disease in Ayurveda. When we talk of functions, there are many contributing factors to a function. You cannot say that it's a single parameter system. There are many contributing factors. Structures play an important role for a function to manifest there has to be a structure. So if I am moving my hand, movement is a function. Without the bones, it's not, the movement is not going to occur. And the bones will have to have the right shape as well. Biochemistry has to be the right one. And I have shown some parameters here, electrical, magnetic, mental and emotional activities and many more parameters which I have not bothered to show on the slide. All these contribute to a function. It's interesting to see structures and biochemistry inbuilt into part of function. These two are the perspectives of modern medicine. And it is inbuilt, it's part of function. So if there is a system, medical system, which has a functional perspective, it's going to be very different to that of a structural or biochemical perspective. Human system is very complex and there should be more than one way of looking at the system. You can have a structural standpoint, you can have a biochemical perspective or you can perceive the system through functions. As the perspectives change, the language associated with it will also change. The terminologies associated with these standpoints will also change. The priorities will also change. This is something like how the same matter can be understood from different viewpoints from physics, chemistry and biology. Physics will talk of interaction of forces between particles. Chemistry will talk of the same matter in terms of how these particles, molecules can be arranged and rearranged to form new substances and if the matter is a animated matter, biology will talk of life in the matter, right? So as the perspectives change, terminologies also change. Nobody asks physics to be explained in terms of chemistry and chemistry to be explained in terms of biology. So one should not ask Ayurveda to be explained in terms of modern medicine. The perspectives are different. Even the language that a modern surgeon and a internal medicine doctor will talk is different. Right? The surgeon will talk of tissues and muscles and tendons. Right? He is not going to talk of proteins and genes. You know, when he is doing surgery, he is not going to talk of what's going to happen to a gene and the protein, he will be talking at a different level. Right? So, these three viewpoints use different terminologies and as I said, Ayurveda's major perspective is functional. When we have a system as complicated as a human system, we need to have some way to classify and categorize the system. Otherwise, it becomes very difficult to handle the information. We have seen how modern medicine has classified and categorized the human system. They have done it based on structures. They have grouped together organs which contribute, which are involved in a particular function. Ayurveda has also done a functional classification. They have identified three major functions. These are functions which according to Ayurveda are major, right? Movement, metabolism and growth and in the context of Ayurveda, these are called Vata, Pitta and Kapha. These are terminologies in Sanskrit, the language of Ayurveda. For convenience, I am going to refer to these as VP and K. Without going into the nitty gritty details, let me give you all a flavor of what goes on, what comes under this classification. So all movements in body and mind comes under Vata. Ayurveda never delinks body and mind. 
body and mind is always considered as one cohesive unit be it in understanding health be it in understanding disease be it in handling the patient movements gross movements like this or a subtle movement here you can see the movement of the heart and movement of the blood or something even subtler you can see the molecules moving in and out of the cell membranes or something even subtler movement of thoughts all movements from gross to subtle comes under vata all metabolic processes comes under pitta digestion and transformation of food or even digestion and transformation of thoughts and emotions ph and temperature are two defining parameters which comes under pitta let me again reiterate the point that these are taken from classical ayurvedic texts it is not my own interpretation it is just that i am explaining these in english we know that ph and temperature plays a very important role from modern science point of view as well ph and temperature or play a very major role in metabolism and transformation of course ayurveda doesn't use the word ph it uses the word acidity in case you are wondering what is digestion and transformation of thoughts let's imagine that five people are given the same piece of information i am sure you all will agree that the reactions will not be the same it can make somebody sad it can make somebody angry it can make somebody moderately happy it can make somebody very happy another person can become very caustic and sarcastic right information is the same how it is taken in and if i may use the word how it is digested and transformed in the brain will define how the person is going to react to the information so this is this comes under pitta and kapha deals with physical growth and support you can see the growth of a fetus here kapha is responsible for structural basis stability and lubrication there are many more parameters which comes under vata and pitta but you know i'm not giving you all a detailed list my aim is to just give you all an idea how systematically they have done the classification so all the psychophysiological functions comes under the come under the broad based category of uh, vpk and each of which is also subdivided into five subtypes so between these 15 subtypes all the psychophysiological functions can be covered so there are no psychophysiological functions which comes outside the purview of this classification now a very notable feature in this functional model adopted by ayurveda is the absence of hierarchy so here you see the structural hierarchy you have atoms then you have molecules then you have organelles and so on here in this functional model of ayurveda it's not that movement comes first and then metabolism and transformation and then growth all these happen side by side i have tried to convey this through this picture of russian nestling dolls so there are two important features of russian in russian nestling dolls one is that all these smaller dolls will go into the big one but what is of relevance to us is that if you use a magnifying lens and look at the smallest doll however small this doll is you will see not a single feature of this mist here all the features that you see here you can see in the smallest doll so in the same way whether you are looking at the system from the view point of cells or tissues or organ systems these three functions ayurveda considers important movement transformation and growth you will see these at all levels so if ayurveda if vpk covers only the psychophysiological functions probably i wouldn't be here giving this talk probably i wouldn't have studied ayurveda at all and probably ayurveda wouldn't be a successful clinical medicine what has made it a pragmatic successful clinical medicine is the second point here that vpk also includes biophysical chemical and physiological parameters so the kind of parameters that ayurveda talks about are dryness fluidity adhesivity stiffness viscosity size weight roughness you don't have to be a scientist to know that a change in any of this will affect movement 
a patient who has had a stent put in would be given blood thinners right what would a blood thinner do it will change the fluidity so it will make sure that the blood the viscosity of the blood doesn't change and it doesn't become thick because if it becomes thick it cannot do its function that is movement so the fluidity and the viscosity of the blood is maintained the other parameters that ayurveda talks about are ph and temperature so what our the ancient indians seem to have done is they have identified three major functions and grouped under these three major functions factors parameters which impact these functions and these parameters are all connected so this is just a small example so if there is change in dryness there will be change in movement temperature fluidity heaviness lubrication roughness and many other parameters as well so in fact ayurveda looks at the system as a network of system properties these are all biophysical properties and some of them are like ph and temperature they are chemical and physiological in nature so this is not a theoretical network it's a network of parameters taken from information from ayurvedic texts so v1 to v7 are parameters which comes under vata p1 to p7 comes under pitta and k1 to k1 comes under kapha let's look up at a couple of parameters and see whether it has any relevance in modern medicine or modern science let's take the example of dryness this is a very elegant experiment done i didn't do it somebody else had done dryness is induced in a systematic way in a cell so you can see that when you move from left to right as the cells become dry you can see a change of the cell wall cellular wall so what's the implication of this this will restrict the movement of nutrients and molecules in and out of the cell so dryness in cells causes morphological or structural changes this in turn causes functional disruption so dryness has some relevance at the level of cell and dryness in tissues will cause atrophy this is the alzheimer brain where there is atrophy of tissues of course modern medicine looks at alzheimer from a different perspective in tune with its fundamental philosophy ayurveda will look at it from a different perspective in tune with its fundamental philosophy so it will say that there is dryness in the system and the tissue has atrophied and that's how it will diagnose and give the treatment so and we all know the link between dryness and movement be it mechanical parts or even in the movement in a biological system if there is dryness if there is a reduction of lubrication it's going to affect the movement imagine what happens if there is dryness in the heart it's beating non stop it has to be well lubricated otherwise it will affect its movement you can see here dryness has restricted the to how wide this person can open the mouth and nothing in our system is static everything is in constant motion there is not a single ion there is not a single molecule which is sitting in an isolated compartment static everything is in com uh, constant motion these are all you know movements that happen inside us although modern medicine doesn't talk about dryness per se it does talk about conditions called medical dryness for example dryness in eye is xerophthalmia dryness of mouth is xerostomia dryness in bowel causes constipation dryness in any tissue will cause atrophy dryness of joints will cause osteoarthritis and dryness of skin is xerosis i will use this slide to bring out once again the difference between modern medicine and ayurveda let's take the example of osteoarthritis modern medicine says that the synovial fluid which acts as a lubricant between joints is reduced and this causes 
friction when the joints move because the lubricating fluid is reduced. This friction will cause inflammation, it will cause restricted mobility. Now Ayurveda osteoarthritis is not a new disease. In fact, many of the diseases are old diseases. Ayurveda says that dryness has increased in the entire system and for that particular patient, the vulnerable point is the joint. So the dryness, increased dryness is, has manifested through the joint as osteoarthritis. If the vulnerable point was the bubble, the patient will be severely constipated. If the vulnerable point was the skin, the patient will have very dry skin, something like psoriasis. So the treatment is not the joint, but it is this. The therapeutic target for in Ayurveda are these biophysical properties. So treatment would be to reduce dryness in the system, in the entire system. By doing that, all these others will be prevented. And then there will also be a local treatment. Treatment to the organ where the disease has already manifested. So this is a big difference between how Ayurveda and modern medicine understands, perceives diseases and handles them. Let's look at another parameter. So dryness, I am sure you all will agree, it has relevance at the level of cell, at the level of uh, tissues as well. And as I said, you know, although modern medicine doesn't give a lot of importance to dryness, they do have conditions which talk about medical dryness. Let's look at another parameter, stiffness. This is a paper which was published in PLOS One, which is a mainstream science journal. Look at the title. Cell stiffness is a biomarker of the metastatic potential of ovarian cancer cells. The biophysical parameters that Ayurveda talks about and uses to understand health and disease are beginning to be looked into in modern medicine as well. And this is just a small example. Stiffness, yes, so stiffness has some relevance at the level of cells and stiffness in tissues, you know, we all feel, feel it at some point or the other. We have a stiff back, we have a stiff shoulder and so on. So Ayurveda is talking of properties which are applicable at all levels. So dryness can be, it has relevance from the level of cell, which is a fundamental unit to the entire organism. So in fact, all the parameters that Ayurveda talks are applicable at all levels. Ayurveda talks of system properties, it talks of interaction between the system properties. Now I would like to draw your attention to systems biology. I am sure you know uh, some of you may have heard. It is the in thing in modern biology where instead of focusing on a metabolite or a gene or a protein, they are beginning to, biologists are beginning to talk of interactions between the components of a biological system or cellular components. So modern medicine is trying to move away very slowly from its reductionistic viewpoint. It's trying to, it's now beginning to understand that a holistic healthcare is important that you need, to, you need to treat the person, uh, person as a whole. So systems biology is coming up in a very big way in modern medicine. So systems biology talks of interactions and how these interactions give rise to emergent properties and functions and how information from the lower level, lower level limits understanding the complexity of the system. Let me explain this a bit more, but I would like to draw your attention to this first point interactions between components of a biological system and this Ayurveda talks of interactions between system properties. So let's go back to this model and here you see a new subtitle here emergent properties at each level. What does it mean? Look at this level of atom. There are no chemical bonds here. Chemical bonds is a property that you see only at the level of molecule. 
it's an emergent property at the level of molecule. So, as you keep moving up the structural hierarchy, you will see new functions which emerges. Let's look at this last, last point here. Information from the lower level limits the understanding of the complexity of the system. Let's move from atom to molecule. Let's take the example of water. We all know that water is made of hydrogen and oxygen atoms, right? But the property of water is not equal to property of hydrogen plus property of oxygen. Hydrogen is a highly inflammable gas and water is used to put off fire. A very simple example, we all know that the boiling point of water is 100 degrees centigrade. Look at the boiling points of hydrogen and oxygen. Boiling point of hydrogen is minus 252.8 degrees centigrade and that of oxygen is minus 183 degrees centigrade. I mean it's not even, they don't even add up to 90 degrees, not even 80, not even 10 degrees, not even 0 degrees, right? So, this is the kind of complexity we face when we move from, it's a small step from atom to molecule. So, you cannot understand this level by understanding the constituents which make this. By understanding hydrogen and oxygen individually, you cannot understand the water molecule. You imagine the, the, the levels between molecule and the organ system, the entire human system. So, when you go from here to here, something new emerges. When you go from here to here, something new will emerge. As you keep moving up the structural hierarchy, you know, there are new emergent properties and you cannot understand this at this level. This is something that's being increasingly realized and that's why, you know, systems biology is coming up in a very big way where they are talking of interaction between particles, between cellular components actually. So, this is a network of genes taken from a systems biology book. So, you can have a network of genes or you can have a network of proteins, you can have a network of small metabolites. So, they talk about metabolomes, genomes and proteomes and it is on purpose that I have drawn this network of system properties in Ayurveda to kind of bring out the similarity between the two. So, in a network, these circles are called nodes and these lines are called associations. The only difference between this network and this network is what is defined by these circles or the nodes. Here it could be a protein or a gene or a small metabolite, here it is system properties, right? So, here I have a second pop-up. Is Ayurveda really as antiquated and obsolete as we think? So, when B, P and K are connected, they are connected and when it is in balance, it denotes health and disease is a system perturbation. So, each one of us have a particular equilibrium condition and when it goes off equilibrium, it's disease and the job of the Ayurvedic doctor is simply to get this network back to balance. So, I told you all that Ayurveda is a theory based system. This VPK is nothing but the theory of VPK. When I studied Ayurveda, something that really uh, struck me was the number of theories. It is loaded with theories and you know as a student of physics, for me this was fascinating. There are definitions for everything and there are theories and this theory of Vata, Pitta and Kapha is one of the many theories that Ayurveda talks and all these theories are inputs from the various darshanas as I have already mentioned. So, let us see how this theory of VPK has been translated to successful clinical practice because they have understood human system based on VPK. They have brought in all factors which play a role in health and disease onto the same platform of VPK. Be it plants, animals, these are part of our diet and also used for making medicines 
for food ingredients environment lifestyle activities all these play a role in health and disease and the clinical symptoms everything speaks the same language of vpt again without going into the nitty gritty details let me give you all an idea about how this classification of has been done all physical substances it can be plants it can be minerals it can be metals it can be milk it can be water vegetables fruits the spices that we eat that we use in our cuisine all are classified in terms of the six tastes these are called rasa sweet sour salt hot bitter astringent these in turn are understood classified in terms of understood in terms of vpk so for example something with a sweet taste modern chemistry will say that it has so much carbohydrates or fats or sugars in it these are all structural entities this kind of understanding is again in tune with its fundamental philosophy of reductionism ayurveda does not have this nuanced information but it can tell you something much more important it can tell you what it does in the system so something with a sweet taste will increase k and decrease p and v in other words a sweet taste substance will increase certain functions and parameters and will decrease certain other functions and parameters so this is a thumb rule for all the home remedies what we call grandma's remedies this is what is used all the mothers and grandmothers knew this a simple example let's take wet cough and cold by the way the word cough is from the word kapha so when kapha increases the clinical symptom is wet cough and cold we should not have anything that increases kapha and we should have things which decreases k so look at the taste which increases k sweet sour and salt these tastes have to be avoided look at the ones which decrease k hot bitter and astringent so adding a dash of haldi turmeric or pepper or ginger is based on this because those they fall under this hot bitter and astringent category so this is how all um, substances are understood this is just an example of how systematically the categorization has been carried out over 5000 plant parts they have not uh, left any parts of the plant root root bark stem stem bark pith leaf bud flower seed fruit rind of fruit etc 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 they have been individually categorized according to the taste it is phenomenal work that the ancient indians have done in a way it's not surprising because we are talking of a system which has been working on this for 5000 years not all parts of the plant need have medicinally useful uh, activity so the medicinally useful parts of a plant have also been identified and they have been analyzed for their effects on vpk these have been very systematically documented this is just an example of how the classification has been carried out terminale chebula which is uh, in hindi it's called harath the medicinally useful part is the fruit you see the information given by ayurveda there are five tastes associated with the fruit the seed marrow covering the seed which is a very very fine part ridges at its attachment bark of the nut each of these have different tastes so the question of working out the taste is in my opinion is not simply tasting and telling what the taste is i have tried to isolate these parts and try to taste it you can't feel any of these taste 
So it's not a question of tasting and telling. So they must have had a very systematic methodology. We do not know what kind of methodology was used. A typical example I always give is honey. Honey, I don't think there's, there would be any second opinion that it is sweet in taste, right? But it doesn't come under the sweet category, it comes under the astringent category. Because the pharmacological action from an Ayurvedic perspective is that of an astringent taste. The kind of pharmacological activity that honey has. So, it's not a question of, I'm sure, you know, a taste as a chemical sense would have played a role, major role, but then, you know, they seem to have gone beyond it and it's a functional classification. They also give lot of information about what happens if a particular taste is used in excess. For example, excess use of sweet taste impacts kapha and it results in a number of diseases. You can see some familiar names, obesity, diabetes, adhesion and block in vessels and so on. So this kind of detailed information is given for all the six tastes. So much about how physical substances are understood in terms of taste. Activities are also understood, classified in terms of VPK. Activity, physical activity, exercise increases vata. Exercising in hot weather, exercising at 12 noon will increase pitta as well. Happy frame of mind, a sedentary life will increase K. So when I say VP and K are increased or decreased, please remember that it's certain functions and parameters which are increased or decreased. Stress, strain and worry increases vata. Negative emotions like jealousy and anger will increase pitta. All clinical symptoms are also classified in terms of VPK. Couple of examples. If it's a shifting pain, it is associated with vata. Shifting pain is a very typical clinical symptom in chikungunya. I have been very lucky to have had chikungunya, so I know per, I have a personal experience of what is a shifting pain. If I had not had that, I wouldn't have believed this. When there is association of burning sensation, it's pitta related fever. When it is a dull and heavy pain, it's kapha related. Another quick example, fever. If it's a fluctuating fever, like as in malaria, during the daytime, temperature is normal and come evening, you know, temperature increases, it's a vata related fever. If the patient complains of burning sensation in the eyes and bitter taste in the mouth, it's a pitta related fever. If the patient has wet cough and cold and a low grade fever hovering around normal or around say 100 degrees centigrade, then it's kapha related. So there are no clinical symptoms which comes outside the purview of this classification. It could be multiple sclerosis, it could be dengue, it could be swine flu, it could be uh, autoimmune diseases. All the symptoms come under this categor uh, categorization. So let's imagine the hypothetical situation of a patient going to a Ayurvedic uh, allopathic doctor. The doctor studies the symptoms and treats the symptoms. If there is pain, painkillers are given. If there is inflammation, anti-inflammatory drugs are given. If there is temperature, antipyretic medicines are given. Let's imagine that the same patient is going to an Ayurvedic doctor. Clinical symptoms presented will be the same. That's not going to change. But you see here how this theory of VPK is used for diagnosis. From the symptoms, the causative factor is worked out. The causative factor of the disease is an imbalance in VPK. The clinical symptoms are connected with the causative factor. That's how Ayurveda treats the root cause of the problem. The root cause of the problem according to Ayurveda is an imbalance in BPK. In fact, they can even go further back. They can identify the diet and lifestyle activities which would have caused this imbalance. So from the symptoms, they identify the root cause of the problem and treat the root cause of the problem, which is why a good Ayurvedic doctor 
diagnosing the disease properly and as long as the disease is not in a very very chronic stage this doctor can give you a complete recovery there will not be recurrence of the disease because the causative factors are taken care of that's what is addressed so there is always a question when ayurvedic doctors say they can handle like dengue or chikungunya or any of the diseases which were not known uh, you know in the times of charaka and sushruta and the questions are always asked and people are justified in asking these questions that how can ayurvedic doctors treat claim to be able to treat a disease which was not known even 20 30 years ago for example chikungunya this virus has taken a different avatar in the past maybe 20 30 years the answer is simple they have the theory of vpk and they apply this theory and they can make the diagnosis so this is like you no know, the simple theory of addition subtraction and multiplication which we all study in primary school you don't have to know all the complex problems that you can apply it to as and when a problem is given you can apply these simple theories so in the same way vpk is a simple theory which can address the complexity which addresses the complexity of the human system seasons are also understood classified in terms of vpk so this is a circa annual rhythm you can see that as the seasons change there are six seasons summer rainy season autumn early winter late winter and spring as the seasons change you can see that there are changes in vp and k in other words if you can sync your diet and lifestyle activities in sync with the changing seasons you can avoid many of the seasonal diseases we cannot have we should not have the same diet and lifestyle activities throughout the year this kind of do's and don'ts were inbuilt into our traditional cuisine and practices so this is called ritu charya ritu means seasons and charya is refers to regimen so these are seasonal regimens which if we follow will help us avoid many of the seasonal diseases now this is circadian rhythm so ayurveda talks not only of circa annual rhythm it also talks of circadian rhythm which is over a 24 hour cycle which is what happens in a day so you can see that as the day progresses there are changes in vpk in other words if we sync our day activity daily activities in sync with this we can have a very satisfactory and a productive and a happy and a relaxing day so there is a time to eat there is a time to sleep there is a time which is congenial for mental activities <coughs> and if we sync with this with this changes then we can have a very happy and productive day i would like to draw your attention to the fact that the 2017 medicine nobel prize nobel prize for medicine went for work on circadian rhythm the names of the three american uh, scientists are here and ayurveda not only talks of circadian rhythm it gives you practical methods to adopt it in your day to day activities so you will see this question popping up once again so vpk provides the conceptual framework for the all the psychosomatic life processes so when the clinic based on the clinical symptoms the disease is diagnosed as vp or k it can be a combination it can be a disease involving vata pitta or pitta kapha or vata kapha or involving all the three doshas once the diagnosis is made all these factors are made use of 
to give the treatment. So plants, let's say that based on the clinical symptoms is the vata predominant disease. Plants which decrease vata are used for making medicines. Food items which decrease vata are prescribed. Food items which increase vata ought to be avoided. Lifestyle activities which increase vata have to be avoided. The ones which decrease vata will be prescribed. And the seasons, the Ayurvedic treatment is very dynamic. The medicines which are given during summer will not be given to the same patient in winter. So it's a very dynamic treatment because we have seen the relation between VPK and, uh, and the environment as well. So the treatment in Ayurveda is very comprehensive. Diet and lifestyle activities is the first line of treatment in all diseases because this is considered the causative reason for the disease. In fact, modern, in modern medicine also, when dreaded disease, diseases like cancer, they are coming into the ambit of diet and lifestyle related. Right? And then there are internal medicines, there are procedures called panchakarma, there are external uh, applications as well and of course yoga is uh, prescribed when and where required. You will see this question popping up here because modern medicine is beginning to realize the importance of diet and lifestyle activities. So this is a picture of a forest and from this height you can capture the landscape in its entirety and this is a picture of microscopic structure of one of the leaf in one of the tree here. This is a long shot, this is a close shot, close up shot. So from here you lose the entire picture, from here you lose the nuances, right. So different heights gives you different views, different views gives you different understanding and different understanding gives you not only different terminologies but different methodologies to handle the system. This theory of VPK is applicable to the plant kingdom and the animal kingdom. So you have Vriksha Ayurveda which is Ayurvedic botany. You also have Mriga Ayurveda which is Ayurvedic veterinary science. So all biological systems from humans to animals and plants are described within the single framework of VPK. So probably this is the only one which is very antiquated. It doesn't go with this time at all when health is a big business. Ayurveda, this is in tune with the Indic thought. May all be happy, may all be healthy, may all enjoy prosperity and may none suffer. This was the high level of thinking uh, of our ancestors. And uh, thank you so much for this patient uh, hearing. So, uh, thank you for a great talk. I just wanted to ask you, what is your opinion on uh, the modern uh, research that some people are doing in terms of isolating the active principles in many of these herbs and things that people find are actually empirically efficacious? So, uh, from the Ayurvedic point of view, once such uh, discovery is made and that such and such is the active principle, uh, then would Ayurveda actually adopt? a tablet made of that active principle. Ayurveda does not, it has got no relevance to Ayurveda. Ayurveda has a very sophisticated pharmacology, Ayurvedic pharmacology and the way, just use of plants doesn't make something Ayurveda. There is a method for preparing the medicines. So Ayurveda does not talk of isolate, isolating active principles. It uses the ingredients in its native form. So if a leaf is used, it is used in its native form. And Ayurveda also doesn't uh, talk of single ingredients. Many of the Ayurvedic formulations are multi-ingredient polyherbal formulations. So isolating active principles, it may give lead molecules to medicines 
which can be used by allopathic doctors but it has got no relevance to ayurveda ayurveda doesn't it's not that ayurveda doesn't know about it but it's looking at it from an entirely different perspective and many of the ayurvedic formulations are also multi targeting so when a formulation has many ingredients and each ingredient is used in its native form there are thousands of molecules in there which probably helps it in its multi targeting potential so this kind of active principles has in my opinion no role to play in ayurveda unless we are able to classify these molecules as vata pitta and kapha if somebody can do it then probably ayurveda there may be some interest yeah, that reminds me i think sarvagandha uh, the case 50 60 years ago Absolutely. and then they isolated recipient from it and used it to treat blood pressure whereas in the old ayurvedic system you use the whole sarvagan yes this is a very typical example given so sarvagandha is used extensively in ayurveda and there are no side effects lisopin has been uh, isolated from it and uh, although there was lot of hype when it finally when it uh, was initially uh, isolated and was used for hypertension i think now people are realizing that there are more and more side effects so it's not a question of when you take something out of context out of its context then its action is not the same amazing doctor uh, my question is from consumer point of view of the for the curative aspect of ayurveda uh, the no prevalence of non communicable diseases has increased in last 30 40 years so my question is that is ayurveda equipped to deal with those non communicable diseases given that not much research has been done in ayurveda in last uh, few centuries why do you assume that no research has been done in the last not few much. centuries people are not aware right it's it's always been a dynamic system which has kept uh, you know it has been updating uh, it's 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 uh, not only knowledge but you know the the material and you know the uh, the plants and so new plants have always been added on to it and it has been a very dynamic system it's a it's a misconception that uh, ayurveda is uh, static and no research has Uh, uh, occurred so ayurveda is equipped to handle non communicable diseases as i said you know the many of the non communicable diseases are also diet and lifestyle related yeah and one of the strength of ayurveda is its knowledge on diet and lifestyle related diseases so yes so once the disease reaches that stage it can there are there are many ayurvedic doctors who handle non communicable diseases very effectively it's just that there is no awareness about uh, uh, what is actually happening so there are um, many assumptions and presumptions about what ayurveda can do or what it cannot do what has been done what has not been done so the level of awareness about ayurveda is pretty dismal uh <clears throat> what about uh, genetic diseases how does ayurveda does talk of genetic diseases and according to ayurveda genetic diseases are not curable and but let me hasten to say that the genetic diseases ayurveda talks about are not exactly the genetic diseases that modern medicine talks about i have seen ayurvedic doctors I have had personal interaction with ayurvedic doctors who have cured some of the genetic disorders and these are genetic disorders from the modern medical point of course you know we need more data you know there is uh, even the ayurvedic fraternity themselves they are confused about whether whether uh, uh, how effectively ayurveda can handle 
a genetic disorders you will have ayurvedic doctors telling that you know if a patient comes with a genetic disorder they will say you know this is not curable you will have ayurvedic doctors who will say you know who will look at it from a completely ayurvedic perspective and say this is not listed under one of the genetic disorders in the text so they will be ready to handle so what what, what that, yeah what, and what do they call them call it kulaja vyadis sorry kulaja so there are her- they they talk about genital uh, genetics uh, disorder and you know uh, uh, congenital uh, uh, abnormalities and uh, for this later you know ayurveda has a lot of uh, 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 a lot of uh, things to offer so from the time of conception uh, how to uh, improve the uh, quality of the uh, the uh, how to make sure that the fetus grows healthily so there are lots of uh, uh, information and methods and you know uh, strategies given but any example madam of how ayurvedic practitioners cured uh, let's say a genetic disorder i don't remember uh, this the particular name of this disorder but i can tell tell you the uh, give you some details so this was a child um i think the child was maybe 7 years old and uh, the child had uh, um a syndrome it was a genetic disorder uh, where the, the the growth of the child is affected in many ways mainly the bones the child has a uh, um uh, respiratory problem the child has a uh, uh, skin problem as well so this child was 7 years old and it had only two teeth so it had a teeth somewhere here on the upper jaw and then one here and the child was 7 years old the child had uh, the the hair growth was pretty abnormal i mean very very little hair on the head of the child the child had uh, respiratory problems and the child also had a um, very high body temperature i think this if i remember right this condition uh says that the child does not have sweat glands if i remember right it has sweat glands so the child had a very high body temperature because of this the child was always kept in a ac room air conditioned room and this used to aggravate the respiratory problem the child also had skin problem so even a small scratch you know it used to become a rash and uh, you know kind of uh, uh, a liquid used to was out of that scratch so it was in this condition that the child was uh, brought in how i know is i was uh, with the doctor who actually gave the treatment the this was uh, the treatment was given i think maybe about 8 9 years ago uh but within i think 6 to 7 months the child had about 10 if i remember right 10 teeth the body temperature of the child came down the child was not going to school because it it always had to be in a ac atmosphere and the body temperature uh, came down and the child started going to school and because it was out of the ac environment the skin problem and respiratory problems were also you know reduced so this is i don't remember the name of the uh, disease but this is a genetic disorder ayurveda has a lot of things in its kitty to handle mental disorders because as i said you know mind and body is always considered as one cohesive unit and all the ayurvedic medicines act till the level of the manomaya kosha and there are lot of non pharmacological uh, um, modalities as well where medicines are not given yoga is a non pharmacological modality so chanting mantras uh, um, yoga meditation so all these and you know the food we eat ayurveda believes and says that it also affects our mind so there are medicines which there are uh, diet and dietary changes made for 
uh, people with mental disorders. Again, you know, the mental disorders will fall into the category of vata, pitta or kapha. Or it can have, it can be vata, pitta or pitta. It can be a combination of the doshas. So, depending on uh, the, the which doshas are involved, there will be medicines which are given, internal medicines, external applications, panchakarma can also be, will also be done, diet changes will be carried out, yoga will be uh, uh, prescribed, meditation and you know, things which will work on the mind. Is it true that Ayurveda used to treat uh, patients with vibration? Mantras or vibrations? Sound waves or vibrations, isn't it? Yes. So when mantras are chanted, basically it's a vibration the patient is subjected to, is exposed to vibrations. So that's what you say that non-pharmacological treatment. Yeah. When I say non-pharmacological, no medicines, drugs are used. Yeah. Uh, secondly, uh, uh, when you are giving the talk, you say that uh, Ayurveda is theory based. Oh. Mostly. So, is it not that it is experiential, like it was like from the experience of the Rishis or Munis that they had like derived to some kind of conclusions? If we compare well, it to. Well, I mean, there is a section of people who think it's experiential, but as one who has studied uh, Ayurveda and you know as one who has been trained in science and then you know when I studied Ayurveda I was 41, 41 years old. So um, I don't think there is a lot of information which probably experiential would always be there but there is a lot of information which you would think has arisen from experiments. And for example, the way uh, uh, tastes have been categorized. I mean, there are over 5,000 plant parts which are categorized under taste. So each plant part can be uh, a combination, as a single taste or a combination of two, three, four, or five tastes. Like yes. And they must have had methodology. And even for diagnosis, for example, they talk about uh, uh, prameha. Prameha, you know, there are 20 types of prameha. Prameha is a condition where the patient has excessive urination, right? One of the, one among the 20 types is correlated with diabetes. And they give methodologies for diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So, they ask certain herbs to be added to the urine. Or you add urine to rice grains. And you see the change in color. No, so there are, even for jaundice, it is said. So there are methodologies which the Ayurvedic texts themselves talk about. And you look at the darshanas which have contributed to Ayurveda. So in the Ayurvedic text, they say that they have taken information from the darshanas, right? So Vaiseshika talks about the importance of direct observation. It talks about Pratyaksha Pramana. Pratyaksha is, you know, what you see is a direct perception. And it says that when you are trying to understand about the human system, direct perception is very important. So there are lots of clues there which tells you that, you know, they must have had some kind of experimental methodology. We do not know what they did. But you know, the information is so detailed and so systematically documented. As a scientist, it's very difficult for me to believe that everything is everything is experiential. How can we believe that it has to be only theory based? Because you know, without uh, experi experiment or experience, see, how accurately are, they could, uh, you know, uh, give see, such kind of two uh, things. medicine? You know, one is that it works to this day. BPK is a theory. It's a theory which can be applied, which is applied to even uh, new diseases and it works. And again, right? every human uh, system is different. Ayurveda is also personalized. It talks about Prakriti. It's a very personalized system of medicine. So now we are talking of big data. Right. Ayurveda has had huge data. Right? It is just a you know, terminology given. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you see, what? Something that that had surprised me is how 
uh, the the ancient uh, Ayurvedic Vaidyas were very keen observers. Not only were they very keen observers, they were documenting everything. They were very keen documenters. So there was, as I said, you know, it's one of the most systematically documented medical systems in the world. We have managed to lose many of the texts and we are happily unaware of it. But even what has survived is, you know, it's mind-boggling. If you leave your prejudice, forget that you are Indian. Look at it as a text, as a textbook with clinical information. If you look at it in a very objective way, exactly. you, you have to draw logical inference. You have the results there. When you have the results, how they had arrived at it. So, you, I don't know whether you remember the slide I showed on the contribution of Mimamsa. Mimamsa gives you the methodology for deducing information from data, from textbooks, from data. So, they have had huge amount of data. This is my viewpoint on this. Huge amount of data, you know, over, uh, collected over and documented over thousands of years. They must have, Indians are very good at tarka and logic. Deductive reasoning is what they had applied. They must have applied, brought in some kind of categorization to this huge data. And then, you know, they must have deduced it, you know, in a very, very systematic manner. And they must have got the theories. And, you know, these theories also, are, they are also from the nature. So, they see, because their viewpoint is that we are part of the nature. So, whatever is in the macrocosm, you see it in the microcosm as well. So, these are theories drawn from nature. The sun, whether it is now or 5000 years ago, it's the same. What the air does is the same. What the fire does is the same. So, information, inference has been drawn from nature and which is why this theory worked 5000 years ago. It's working now. It will work another 10,000 years, years later because molecules may change. Genes which are expressing now, you know, may not be expressed. Something may get mutated. But these are laws which do not change, which has not changed, which will not probably change as well. Uh, another question. Uh, system biology is very newborn. Uh, system biology, systems biology is a newborn right now. So now, uh, when you had shown the, uh, you know, diagram, there's a very uh, similarity between how Ayurveda used to look into atoms and molecules, say, and Let systems biology. Let me tell biology. you, I drew that way on purpose. <laughs> Okay, so I, my question was, uh, is the system biologies of today's generation is loosely or in some way influenced by our Ayurveda? Probably not. I don't think anybody has this kind of level of awareness about Ayurveda. See, so something wonderful about modern science is, you know, it keeps learning, you know, it keeps moving forward and from its experience. So, you know, with all these information it has using its reductionistic approach, it's now realizing that, you know, a single molecule and a single, uh, 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 you know, a uh, gene may not, they may have a limited role. And, you know, human system is very complex. So, because of the influence of classical physics, there was a dealing between mind and matter. Now, they are realizing the importance of mind. So, you know, it's, so it's, it's a learning process. It's still in the process of learning. And uh, so, you know, it, they are now talking of systems biology. I don't think they have taken any clue from Ayurveda, in my opinion. I don't think NMR is required to understand Ayurveda. So, in the way I have explained Ayurveda, NMR doesn't uh, feature in at all. Uh, but it's a wonderful technique which can be used to look into various aspects of Ayurveda for better understanding for ourselves. Uh, you can use, uh, so there are lots of parameters that Ayurveda uses, uh, be it in understanding uh, the uh, uh, plants, be it in understanding the health, be it in understanding diet and nutrition, be it in understanding the pathophysiology. And these are parameters that modern medicine is not talking of, not as yet. And NMR and MR, you know, which is magnetic resonance imaging and spectroscopy, 
it's a very um, uh, useful uh, you know uh, technique to study these parameters to objectivize some of these parameters so in fact my research focuses on objectivizing uh, the parameters that ayurveda talks about uh, using nmr which is my core expertise so i use nmr a high resolution nmr to study medicinal plants and uh, to objectivize the parameters used in ayurvedic pharmacology i also use uh, mri and uh, mr spectroscopy to look into the therapeutic efficacy of ayurvedic treatment what kind of physiological changes are affected by ayurvedic intervention and to also as i said objectivize the parameters that ayurveda talks about so it's a wonderful tool which can be used at all levels it's a non invasive technique so i can use it to study uh, patients without uh, in a, in a non invasive way in contemporary times when uh, allopathy is a mainstream medicine we generally approach to ayurveda when allopathy fails so what would motivate a patient to choose allopathy as a uh, medium over sorry to choose ayurveda over allopathy so what would motivate the patient to choose that First especially is, when there are no documented success stories of ayurveda that is the first drawback uh, because i don't have data ki this will be cured or not it's not true that there is no documented data there the, there is documented data but uh, yes what you are telling is right only when uh, patients uh, uh, when uh, when they do not get relief or cure uh, with allopathy which is a mainstream of medicine they turn to ayurveda see every system has its pluses and negatives right so allopathy has its own strength it has its own limitations so does ayurveda it's not that ayurveda can handle everything it has its positives and it has its limitations what probably is required is awareness uh and uh, i think that's the major thing because there are lots of uh, uh uh assumptions about as i said you know what ayurveda can do and what it cannot do one of the assumption is that ayurveda cannot uh um is not effective in acute conditions that it's only good in chronic ailments this is again a myth so i think awareness is very important it's not that there is no documentation uh documentation is is there but uh, yes the visibility of that should be made better so we need to have uh statistics you know kind of obtained from these documentations which are available so now there are more and more ayurvedic doctors who document the cases there are many ayurvedic centers and institutes which document so these uh, uh, these uh, case histories you know they need to be brought together pooled and we need to work out the statistics and you know then that's something that's the need of the hour there are presumptions that Assume that much research is being carried out there, and second presumption is that three of the material, three of the students, they go for allopathy and not for Ayurveda. Because those students who are going to doctors, so there is a presumption. Is it correct? It's not a presumption. It's right. The second one is unfortunately uh, uh, right, um, and there are there are various reasons. There are various reasons. uh one of the reason is the way society looks at the ayurvedic doctors uh they are not given the same respect that uh, allopathic doctor is given and as you yourself said when this system of medicine doesn't work they go to the ayurvedic doctor so when a patient comes to ayurvedic doctor at the fag end of the disease it's difficult for any system of medicine to handle right and for the patient to expect complete cure you know when uh, when he or she is at the fag end of the disease is it becomes very difficult for the ayurvedic doctor uh it's not justification about the fact that you know there are some ayurvedic doctors who practice uh, uh, allopathy but it is also legal in some states for ayurvedic doctors to practice allopathy 
there are uh, two or three states in india where it's legal for them the while the allopathic doctor doesn't is not exposed to ayurveda in their medical curriculum the ayurvedic student is exposed to a lot of allopathic medicine so we study it as part of our course so it's not that the ayurvedic doctor is completely unaware of the allopathic system they have more knowledge on allopathy than uh, allopathic doctor has on ayurveda but it's not a happy situation in my opinion when ayurvedic system can handle it it is a stand alone system and uh, it can handle um diseases treating diseases very effectively and uh, it's a pity when ayurvedic doctors do not have that confidence the education system should give them that confidence the society should give them that respect they deserve and there are many factors when everything comes together then i think the situation will change for better for ayurveda uh namaskar mera naam akash ji uh, the human genome project sharir ke uh, vikaron aur uske ilaj ko samajhne ke liye prayas karte hain aur path pit kaf jo aapne bataya wo bhi ek tarike se sharir ke vikar aur uske ilaj ke bare mein baat karta hai to kya genome project jo aaj kara ja raha hai aur path pit kaf ki jo rachna ayurved mein hui hai wo ek hi sikke ke do pehlu hain aur agar aisa hai to genome project to ye dawa karta hai ki wo cancer aur hiv jaise asadhya rogon ka bhi ilaj nikal sakta hai kyunki pure एक इंसान का पूरा डीएनए वो सब कुछ समझ सकते हैं तो क्या बात कफ इनसे भी ऐसे असाध्य रोगों का इलाज संभव है सी देयर इज अ सो पर्सनलाइजेशन इन मेडिसिन इज कमिंग अप इन अ बिग वे एंड मॉडर्न मेडिसिन यूजेस जेनेटिक डिफरेंसेस फॉर पर्सनलाइजिंग द मेडिसिन आयुर्वेदा यूजेस प्रकृति uh which is predominantly phenotyping it's not genotype it's a phenotyping that ayurveda uses for personalization so the concept of prakriti is um, much more larger and comprehensive than the genetic variations so the prakriti talks about physical physiological and psychological phenotyping so we are all different physically physiologically psychologically as well and it has to reflect in the genes it will in fact there are very interesting studies which have combined the ayurvedic concept of prakriti and genetic analysis this is coined as ayu genomics where they have shown that the prakriti uh you know mentioned in ayurveda has a genetic basis as well so it's a very uh, uh, uh new field of uh, uh, studies and there are already very good publications in mainstream science journals so yes genes are part and parcel of the human system it will have there will be relation between vata pitta and kapha and the genes and it has already been shown by scientific experimentation can any ayurvedic doctor practice in europe and prescribe medicine i believe this is a problem in germany i think if i am right i'm not very sure but i think in many of the european countries uh, it's not legal to practice ayurveda so ayurveda is practiced as a wellness system and uh, probably ayurvedic medicines are given as used as dietary supplements uh so one need to i'm not very sure whether you know it's all the european countries have uh, this uh, you know there's a legal issue uh, involved but there is lot of uh, uh, interest in ayurveda and there are uh, many ayurvedic many allopathic doctors european allopathic doctors who have studied and trained themselves in ayurveda and they do ayurveda there 
and there are also a lot of uh, uh, Ayurvedic doctors from India going to Europe and uh, uh, treating patients there and there are many people from Europe who come here for Ayurvedic treatment as well. One of the assumptions is that Ayurveda is some kind of jadi buti kind of thing, you know, it's a home remedy, it's a grandma's remedy. So people think that, you know, they can do a self-medication, but it is a science in itself. And if a particular formulation or medicine is used, there is a theory which links the use of medicine to that particular ailment. So self-medication should not be done. And Ayurvedic, the, the patients will have to uh, consult the Ayurvedic doctor because there are many nuanced, uh, you know, uh, nuances in the diagnosis. And as I said, Ayurveda is a personalized system of medicine. So a reason for the causative factor for the, uh, med for the um, disease has to be diagnosed properly. So, for example, uh, let's say that there are two patients with osteoarthritis. One is a vata predominant, vata prakriti person. The other is a kapha prakriti person, right? Now, osteoarthritis will be a disease which a vata prakriti person will be predisposed to. And if he, ha he or she had involved in, indulged in, Vata aggravating diet and lifestyle activities, they would have landed themselves in problem. They would have got osteoarthritis. So the treatment for this patient of osteoarthritis who is Vata Prakriti will be predominantly diet and lifestyle changes because these people are predisposed to that and they had done something that they should not do. So, the way the treatment is strategized is different. Now, for a Kapha Prakriti person to have a Vata disorder like osteoarthritis, it's a pathological condition. So, the treatment will be different. So, it's and they take into uh, uh, consideration the, the occupation, the age, uh, desha, kala, you know, uh, where you are, the environment you are in. So many factors are, because if you say Ayurveda is a personalized medicine, they need to fine tune the diagnosis. To fine tune the diagnosis, they need to have a number of parameters. So this only a well trained Ayurvedic doctor can do. So, you know, taking medicines, maybe they may not uh, have very severe side effects, but you know, it's not going to do the job you expect the medicines to do. That's why, you know, Respect should be given to the Ayurvedic doctor. The Ayurvedic doctor is also trained for five and a half years just like an MBBS doctor is. Four and a half years of theory and one year of internship. It's a rigorous training where the student also studies allopathic medicine. So the student of Ayurveda studies more than what an MBBS student does. I mean, MBBS student does, does not study Ayurveda where the student studies both streams. So they are professionally trained and they need to be consulted. I have seen uh, patients who refuse to pay consultation fee to Ayurvedic doctor. They will say, no, I mean, my grandma can give this medicine. I said, then you go to your grandma and get the medicine. Why are you coming to Ayurvedic doctor? See, it's also a livelihood, you know. And uh, so, you know, there are a lot of, as I said, uh, awareness should, uh, should be increased, you know. People should have the basic information about Ayurveda. Then, you know, they can choose whether they want to believe in it or not, whether they want to consult an Ayurvedic doctor or not. But the basic awareness, basic information should be there. How this should be uh, done, what it can do, what are the disease conditions that Ayurveda, uh, you know, uh, works better and so on. Um, <coughs> what is the relationship of Ayurvedic doctors looking at the taking the stuff like? In finding out uh, what the pit cuff. 
and uh, you also said there is a natural equilibrium so if i'm a pitta kapha personality or pitta pradhan then i have a natural equilibrium uh, and so what happens in disease conditions as either one of them go up and down and that's what you're bringing to balance yeah so not vigyan is one of the uh, cornerstones of ayurveda it it is used for diagnosing uh the status of the state of vata pitta kapha at a particular point in time although i am not sure to what extent it is being used in days of yore it used to be used it was uh, very uh, heavily used uh so i do not know the the course doesn't train the ayurvedic doctor to see the nadi of course there are still uh, uh, very good uh, uh, you know nadi vaidyas you know uh, doctors ayurvedic doctors who can see the nadi and uh, uh, tell you um and there are also there is also a lot of uh, research which happens uh, you know uh, in nadi vigyan so there are instruments which are which have been uh, which are coming up in a big way which can measure the nadi so there are studies done in uh, these developments have happened at individual levels engineers have developed systems for measuring nadi and i think even some of the iits have come up with these uh, so that's that's the first uh, answer to the first part of the question the second is that how do we know did i get your question right how do you know whether something has gone off balance i mean is the process of um vat pit kapha i have a natural equilibrium you're saying so there is a certain uh, so it means pradhan. that you have a you have a prakriti you have a natural prakriti everybody has a prakriti where you know you you may have a vata pitta prakriti which means that there is a predominance of vata and pitta and this is your natural state right so you will have to customize your diet and lifestyle to make sure that these two do not get aggravated so if i have a vata vata predominant prakriti right so that is my equilibrium state i should make sure that the vata doesn't go off balance so i know the diet and lifestyle activities which will aggravate vata i need to keep away from it so this is a uh, prakriti is like a, a chart you have this is like knowing your blood group so if you know your prakriti you can actually uh, find out what kind of diseases you would be predisposed to and you can actually prevent those diseases shirodhara is where uh, uh, medicated oil for certain conditions <coughs> medicated oil is poured on the head here yeah. so as i said you know there are uh, treatments where internal medicines are given external procedures are given so shirodhara falls under the external procedures uh maybe you just uh, one talked about you you have given an answer to his question like uh, uh, the genomic project and uh, you know it's a relevance to ayurveda for example so uh, is it also true for proteomics and uh, metabolomics uh, projects that are being done research being done is there any kind of you know association or ayurveda talks about certain kind of approaches that metabolomics and proteomics are taking up i myself do nmr phytometabolomics uh, i don't know whether metabolomics has any uh, relevance to ayurveda probably not but metabolomics is a uh, methodology you can use to uh look at as i said certain concepts in ayurveda where you are so for example um i do nmr phytometabolomics where i am trying to see if there is a fingerprint for the ayurvedic classification of medicinal plants so the ayurveda classifies the medicinal plants based on uh, rasa taste which is a chemosensory property when you say chemosensory property there are two aspects to it one is a chemical aspect 
something is sweet because of the molecules in it and there is a sensory perception right so i do nmr metabolomics to see if i can fingerprint that classification that ayurveda has so metabolomics will be a very um, handy tool methodology to uh, look at certain things in ayurveda